against which we conduct our affairs. Many of you are probably familiar with the journal Environment and Planning D, Society in Space. He started that um, back in the 1980s, 1980-something. Um, so far away. And um, for many outside the discipline of, of geography, including myself, it served as a kind of gateway into the field just as it was undergoing um, some profound changes. I first came to know Professor Thrift's work through the influential book, Money Space, Geographies of Monetary Transformation, and for me it was a revelation and indeed helped inspire my own program of research in the anthropology of finance. This was a time when I was devouring work outside of anthropology, and not a few of my colleagues teased me that I was developing work on money by reading authors with names like Thrift, Gambling, and Strange. <laughs> but Professor Thrift has also been a terrific mentor, and I'm speaking here sort of from the heart, and a connector, someone who brings others together into a dialogue, sometimes based just on a hunch that folks are fellow travelers willing to share an intellectual journey no matter where it takes them. This has led us down some pretty weird and wonderful paths into pragmatism and phenomenology, literature, drama, embodiment, and non-representational theory. His chapter, Shut Up and Dance, or Is the World Economy Knowable, remains one of my all-time favorite pieces of writing by anyone, anywhere, ever. His engagements with Michel Callon and Marilyn Strathern have been particularly impactful in the field of anthropology. The author, co-editor, and editor of well over 20 books, Professor Thrift is currently Vice Chancellor at the University of Warwick, having previously held positions at Oxford, Bristol, and elsewhere. He's a fellow of the British Academy, an academician of the Academy of Learned Societies for the Social Sciences, and also received the Scottish Geographical Medal, among many other honors and awards. Last year, he was knighted. And I will just add here that Nigel Thrift and Marilyn Strathern each wrote book jacket blurbs for one of my books, and were thereafter knighted and made, made Dame Commander of the British Empire, respectively. <laughs> so I will be selling the rights to blurb my next book <laughs> to the highest bidder so long as you are from the United Kingdom or Commonwealth. There's a couple of you in this room. We can have a little bidding war after the talk. Nigel, I'm absolutely thrilled you could join us during your trip to the States and really looking forward to your talk, Cities in the Anthropocene. Please join me in, in welcoming Professor Nigel Thrift to UC Irvine. So, thank you, Bill. Um, after an intro like that, oh dear, as the saying goes. So, um, really straightforwardly, um, I had a kind of dilemma about what to give as a paper, and um, I do have this beautiful, beautifully honed paper called uh, Ge Why Geography Matters, which I've decided not to give. But I spent so much time on the slides that they're here, so you can watch them. At least it gives you something to look at uh, whilst I'm talking. Um, this uh, piece actually is part of a book I'm writing with uh, a colleague, Ash Amin. And um, it comes out of actually some publishers uh, wandering in in that inimitable way and saying, hey, you wrote a book X years ago, why not update it? And the book that we wrote in this particular case was Cities. And we thought, well, um, we don't really want to update things. We'll, we'll have another go to see if we can get it right this time. Uh, now, I'll leave you to judge that. We're still a long way into getting this into the right kind of shape. Um, and partly that's because I think... Um, like all of these things, uh, Bill's right, I, I do like wandering off into all kinds of areas, but it, it carries its own very specific, specific risks with it, of that there is no doubt. And indeed yesterday I was reading, there is a word for this, uh, it is ultra-crepidate. I'd never heard of it before, uh, which means going beyond your province, but I promise you it exists. Uh, and um, probably that's what this paper is, uh, ultra-crepidate. There we are. Um, what I want to talk about, really, um, is the way in which uh, cities have become really systematic endeavours uh, because of the growth of infrastructure. And that growth of infrastructure, in turn, of course, has been fueling a whole series of problematic developments. And indeed, much of that infrastructure that has been laid down uh, is both a part of and responsible for what is often called the Anthropocene. 
Uh, and what we wanted to do was to talk about this infrastructure in more explicitly political ways. Um, just as you find that there's a move at the moment um, to talk about so-called pre-distribution, uh, where when you are trying to address inequality, you actually start by thinking about things you might be able to do before anyone notices, if I can put it that way. We were thinking about whether it was possible to do these kind of things in terms of infrastructure. Um, in doing that, of course, we can also see at the same time that infrastructure, uh, as it's currently laid down, and as, as often called a kind of frozen politics, has immense kind of issues associated with it. And um, I turn now to um, uh, the novelist Tim Parks, who I, I enjoy wonderfully his books on Italy, and there was this wonderful quote uh, in one of those books, the most recent one, they say that Gothic novels came into being because science and 18th century rationalism were threatening to empty the world of any romance, spirituality or caprice. 200 years later, the planet is full of technology, but utterly irrational. And I don't feel any need for Gothic excitement. Uh, and in a sense, uh, I, I think that's, if you like, the sober point of history that we're now in. So very straightforwardly, in terms of the presentation, um, the equation is infrastructure begat circulation begat the Anthropocene. And in various ways, I'll try and illustrate uh, that particular theme. Uh, but with some words of warning, of course. First of all, um, in many ways, this is familiar ground uh, for geographers. Of that, there is no doubt. Uh, indeed, uh, I can remember as a kid sitting in school being told about, you know, cities being located at points of circulation, uh, talking about trade, etc., etc. And in some ways, uh, what Ash and I are trying to do is actually to revisit those kind of things in a rather different way. Um, so that's the first thing to say. Um, the second thing to say is that at the same time, I think something substantial is actually changing at the moment. If you like, um, very large amounts of the world are now being run on rails. Uh, and um, this is a phrase that um, I was struck by, partly listening to a talk by... Uh, Bill, when he was talking about payment systems, and he was saying they're called rails, uh, and of course those kinds of systems, I think, are now being run out across the world, uh, and I shall come back to it, but the obvious instance of that, I think, is China, uh, and anyone uh, who goes to China can see infrastructure uh, being put down at a pace and at a level which is almost stunning uh, in the way that it actually works. Um, the second thing to say is that in talking about these kinds of issues, there's always this danger of trying to navigate between various kinds of account. Um, so you can always fall over, I suppose, first of all, uh, into the idea of simple doomsaying uh, and equally into appreciation of some of the wonders of the human age. Uh, we're trying to keep this presentation as flat as possible. But I'm not suggesting that every now and then we don't wander off into either of those errors. They're so current in the literature, it's actually quite difficult not to uh, at various points. But we will do our best. So, I want to start simply by talking a little bit about the Anthropocene, but I won't talk for long, uh, most notably because I know there are many experts uh, in the audience, uh, and uh, there therefore seems little point in simply... Uh, reworking their expertise. Um, but certainly, of course, for a long time, we can argue that cities have been, if you like, the real strong points of infrastructure, the points from which it has been built out, and literally built out in various ways, even when we're talking about cultural things. Um, and, of course, uh, that's meant that cities could flourish uh, through the building of infrastructure, held jointly in many cases, but not all. But equally, of course, we could argue that it has caused all kinds of problems. Um, uh, a geographer colleague, Jared Diamond, delights, I think, in asserting that agriculture was a catastrophic mistake uh, from which the human race has uh, never recovered. 
Um, I'm not sure I'm fully of that opinion, I have to say, uh, especially as I look at the food over there. Uh, but still, at the same time, these kind of things uh, are certainly talked about. Whatever the case, uh, cities have had long-term impacts at a number of levels. And I would argue that uh, they are in many ways the motive force of the Anthropocene. Uh, they're the places from which all the good and all the bad often flows. So, to begin with, of course, we can simply look at geologic levels. Um, and I think there's no doubt that cities, the infrastructure of the cities, has laid down a kind of quasi-geologic field. There's a wonderful book by a guy called Jelasevich, um, a geologist, precisely on this, uh, and precisely on what will be left after the human race has disappeared. Uh, and the answer is, a hell of a lot. Uh, rather more than I had thought, I have to say. Uh, there will be a vast aggregate uh, in the geological record. Um, and uh, he speculates uh, in particular about how future archaeologists from some alien race will actually interpret uh, most of this kind of stuff. Uh, and I'm sure they won't interpret it very accurately, but I'm sure it will be entertaining. Then, of course, there's climate change, and I'm hardly going to talk about that. Uh, but again, uh, cities are one of the main drivers, anyway, you look at it, of climate change. Uh, then, of course, there's all kinds of other ways in which uh, change is taking place. Uh, in particular, uh, we can see it taking place through plants and the way that they're being cultivated, specifically, I think, around cities in terms of agricultural systems, uh, and in ways which actually, again, are important. And then, of course, there's simply as well uh, what one might call uh, the field of flesh more generally, and the way that that has been changed by cities, whether you're talking about human beings or whether you're talking about animals in their various forms. Um, and these things, all of them, I think, important. Uh, important, of course, in part because they're producing, along with the good things, extraordinarily bad things uh, at this point in time. So one of the reasons for being interested in cities and the Anthropocene is to try and think about how cities might be redesigned so they don't do the things that they undoubtedly are doing uh, at the moment. Uh, in some ways, I would regard that almost as the major political task uh, that we actually face. Um, one can look at the bad things, but... All of these I think we know, uh, but for example, of course, there's species extinction. Uh, I, I was reading Elizabeth Colbert's book recently, which um, uh, is a wonderful book and deeply depressing, both at the same time. One third of all reef building corals, third of all freshwater mollusks, third of sharks of rays, quart, quarter of all mammals, fifth of all reptiles, sixth of all birds heading towards oblivion. And, of course, extinction can come very quickly indeed. I became absolutely obsessed, for various strange reasons, by the passenger pigeon. I know I've got every single book that exists uh, on the passenger pigeon. But the point being that that bird uh, was tipped into extinction remarkably quickly once it started. Uh, and remember, that bird was an extraordinarily prevalent moment uh, in the North American uh, natural scene. Uh, flocks like battle fronts and colonies resembling cities, indeed some of the largest flocks it was documented were as large uh, as Manhattan when they settled. Um, and of course by September 1914 the last sad passenger pigeon fell off its perch uh, in a zoo in Cincinnati. I suppose Cincinnati is just what good is any place to, to become extinct, but there we are, we can argue about that. Um, but it's worth remembering that was killing 20 million passenger pigeons a year for about a century uh, that actually worked that through. Even so, people are not quite sure why they suddenly, if you like, fell off the ledge in quite that way. Uh, but those kind of things, of course, are being replicated. And part of the reason they're being replicated uh, is because of... Uh, the pressures uh, of cities for space in all kinds of ways, however you might want to put it. The other way, of course, in which cities are registering in particular, of course, is in terms of movement. Uh, Colbert, again, is very nice in talking about a so-called new Pangea uh, in terms of what, a lot of what's going on 
uh, in the natural world. In a sense, what used to be a single continent drifted into many different continents and now is coming back together again uh, so far as many uh, species are concerned. Now, of course, animals have moved all over the place uh, and plants for a very long time. And indeed, uh, the record tends to show they've moved rather farther than people had originally thought and could do this entirely well by themselves. But cities have speeded that process up in quite extraordinary ways. Um, and we can see that, I think, simply by looking at the kind of urban denizens that we now find. Uh, the rat is a perfect example, I suppose. Pacific rats travel all around the Pacific, but of course its travels are com nothing compared with the Norway rat, which of course came from China. Uh, or take the cockroach again. Um, uh, the average New Yorker actually is most likely to encounter the German cockroach, uh, which actually originated in Southeast Asia, whilst the American cockroach is actually a native of Africa. Uh, so we can again see the way that cities have moved all of these kinds of things. And then, of course, the last thing that cities have done is to move human beings around in very, very large quantities. Uh, in the chapter, we talk about this uh, in some detail. There really isn't time to do that now. Uh, but at the same time, the flows of migration, temporary or permanent, uh, that are generated by, in particular, the world's largest cities, are something to behold. Now... One of the reasons that cities can have, if you like, that motive force is because of all the infrastructure that they have access to and which in many ways is what a city is. And what I want to do in the second part of the paper is to look, if you like, under the hood uh, at infrastructure and to try and work through some of the ways uh, in which it actually turns up. Because a good reason, a good part of the reason for all this movement that's going on is the unremarked and mainly urban landscape that we pass every day, which I suppose forms a kind of second nature. Power lines, concrete pavements and tarmac roads, street lights, manholes, traffic signals, mobile telephone towers, doors and windows, all the signs of regulation of movement, uh, and all the paraphernalia of city streets and industrial landscapes. For many of us now, that's, uh, if you like, the authenticity of urban experience. It's not Heidegger's hut or anything of that kind. Uh, and we have to come to terms, I think, in that it's still in quite strong ways. Um, and these networks have produced a part of the planet which is ever in motion. The world's threaded through with roads and cables, undergirded by pipes and tunnels and culverts, saturated by wireless signals, loaded down with all kinds of built infrastructure and heated up by all manner of energy sources. It's crisscrossed by airline routes, lit up by innumerable street and other lights and shaken by all manner of artificial sounds. And that infrastructure, of course, is composed of actual physical stuff which can't be reduced uh, to just a discursive difference. Uh, as Lee Rather puts it, whether or not a commercial district grows as a function of the amount of energy available to that zone from the power plant is not a signifying or cultural difference. Whether or not people begin to die or move away as a result of pollution produced by garbage, coal-burning power plants and industrial waste is not a signifying difference. Whether or not people vote you out of office because they're angry about traffic congestion is not the result of a signifier. To be sure, to be sure, there are social relations here insofar as it's people that produce all these things and people that are flocking into the city, moving away or voting you out of office. But the point is that the form the city takes is not, in these instances, the result of a signifier, a text, a belief or a narrative alone. It's the result of real properties, real properties of roads, power lines, pollution and so on. Um, infrastructure, in other words, consists of all those objects that allow human beings, cars and trucks and boats and planes, water, sewage and other waste, oil, electricity, radio signals, information and the like to flow from one place to another to actually circulate. 
And mainly they consist of continuous conduits, but increasingly, of course, uh, those conduits uh, are not, if you like, in the form of pipes or cables. One only has to think of wireless signals and general wireless infrastructure. And this infrastructure is concentrated in cities because cities require flows of energy and matter in order to maintain their organisation and resist entropy. Cities, of course, require stone, brick, wood, plastics, metals, and a variety of other materials out of which to build and maintain infrastructure. However, cities also require flows of energy to persist across time. They require wood, coal, electricity, the power of water and wind to heat homes, road transportation, and sustain various technologies. And they also, of course, require caloric energy people have to eat. Now, in a way... That was what those original geography textbooks talked about. Um, uh, I think it's true to say that through agents like Environment and Planning D and things like that, we veered a long way away uh, from those kind of things. Uh, but maybe it's time to come back to them uh, in certain senses. The point, after all, is that the Earth's surface has become hundreds of kilometres high and at least four kilometre low anthropic stratum. I had to keep looking to see which was the lowest mine uh, in the world, uh, which is a bit like a Swiss cheese in its makeup, a stratum through which pipes and cables crawl, under which tunnels and boreholes and mine shafts pour down into the earth, on which all kinds of reservoirs and power sources hold sway, and over which airplanes and satellites and wireless signals fly back and forth, uh, nearly all of which is connected to the demands that cities actually make. Uh, and for people who think this is not important, again, come back to China. Uh, look at the road uh, and rail system being put down there. Look at the wireless system being put down there, which actually, uh, in distinction to the United Kingdom, actually works. Uh, and a whole series uh, of these uh, kinds of things. Of course, the result of all this um, is that physical infrastructure really is a kind of hum that we take for granted, uh, at least until it goes wrong. Um, you only have to think of the burst water main or the power cable brought down by an ice, ice storm or the mist delivery. That's, of course, uh, when we actually see these things in operation or not, as the case may be. Um, and a, a while back, actually, I spent quite a lot of time trying to think about maintenance and repair precisely as a way of actually thinking about the way these things are kept going one way or another, because, of course, they require continual effort to keep going. Um, now, having said all that, equally, we have to not forget that infrastructure has its own history. We're captive to a whole series of decisions that were made often centuries ago about how, how infrastructure ought to be. And one of the things I think is an interesting task is to try and think how we can unfreeze that frozen politics and actually see it and actually start to try and change it in knowing kinds of ways. And of course, to begin with, infrastructure is a history of changing the urban environment we actually live in. And there are so many examples of this, from heating to air conditioning, from pipe water supply to pipe music. I mention only those because each and every one of those has actually been the subject of books uh, recently. Um, take just the case of artificial lighting. Uh, night time is no longer another country uh, for most people uh, one way or another. Thanks to reliable and constant artificial illumination produced mainly by large industrial power networks. And of course the process began in Britain uh, in 1807 when Pall Mall was first lit by gas. Uh, and then uh, electric lighting arrived in 1878, though in fact really the world didn't really start to get seriously lit uh, until after the First World War. And now of course artificial light has spread all over the world. Now, we shouldn't again overestimate this. Uh, it's, when I say all over the world, one should be very careful. There are still large parts of the world where that's not the case. For example, in India in 2012 was the largest electrical blackout in human history, which left apparently, so the press said, 600 million people without power uh, and light. Uh, actually, as Amartya Sen said afterwards, 200 million of those 600 people never had any power or light to begin with. Uh, but that's what we call uh, press rhetoric. Uh, 
Um, then going on from that, uh, there's a history of how we can move about in the city. And there's been some very, very nice work done recently on things like, for example, uh, the history of the humble elevator. First introduced in 1852, uh, but now many cities would really cease functioning, at least in their centres, without the elevator. Uh, and of course the built form uh, of cities depends, uh, at least in their centres again, uh, on those elevators actually existing. Indeed, um, uh, I got absolutely fascinated by uh, the, the current technology um, of elevators precisely because um, it is actually changing very rapidly at this point in time. Elevators are going through a major period of technological uh, innovation. Uh, so all these kind of things to think about. Then, of course, it's also the history of how we move things around quite literally. Uh, and if you look at trade in that kind of way, and not just as sets of figures, you can see it that way as well. And, of course, that history goes back so far in time, it's difficult to know when it didn't exist. Uh, Europe, for example, has been a trading zone since around 9000 BCE. Uh, and at least part of that trade was coming, in fact, from uh, cities of one form or another, joining up one way or another. Um, and we live in places, of course, chock full of stuff which is transited from other places. Um, at the current estimate, at any point in time, there are about 100,000 freighters uh, on the ocean. Uh, uh, there have to be about 100,000 around to keep things going. Uh, indeed, Recently, I was in the control room of um, uh, nat natural, National Grid in the UK, um, which actually uh, produces all of the uh, natural gas power generation uh, through a large grid uh, that goes around the country. Uh, and it was at a point where they only had three days of natural gas left, and if the freighter didn't turn up, uh, there were going to be pretty serious problems, actually. And those kind of judgments are having to be made continuously, in fact. And lastly, of course, infrastructure has one other kind of effect. It just moves people around. And in the paper, we talk a lot about diasporas, but many other ways in which one can see these kinds of things happening. So ubiquitous is infrastructure like lighting. Uh, New York has over 250,000 street lights uh, and elevators. New York has at least 64,000 uh, elevators at last count. But this infrastructure is now simply an accepted part of the landscape. More than that, um, it's also a stock scene of human conduct. Uh, if you think about uh, the way in which uh, narratives have changed uh, in terms of human interaction, more and more and more of them, I suspect, are focused precisely around ports, airports, railway stations, service stations, etc., etc., all these places where people meet up and leave again. Um, Mark Auger, uh, a while back, a long while back now, used to call them non-places. Um, I'm really not sure that's even vaguely uh, the right term. Then, of course, how we experience urban space is also completely mediated by infrastructure. It has, in fact, been for quite a long time. Uh, I did a book on um, the history of time, and we got very involved in, in bells for all sorts of reasons. Um, if you do history, you often find that you get more involved than you possibly should uh, in a particular topic to the point where you've drained it of everything you can actually find. Uh, but the fact of the matter is um, we shouldn't think that cities are necessarily noisier now than they were in the past. Um, we did a lot of work uh, on medieval London and it must have been unbelievably noisy. Uh, the cacophony of bells that was going off the whole time, many of which were not coordinated, so you had to choose which time you wanted, uh, made this uh, particularly difficult, I think. But the point is, um, people are now looking to try and find where there are areas of silence in particular places around the world. Um, a scientist, I don't know why did this, a man called Cox recently tried to find a quiet place in the UK, one which was totally devoid of any kind of urban-type noise. And the only place he could find where he was pretty sure 
everything was, if you like, pristine, was a bog in the middle of Northumbria. Uh, which, believe me, God knows how he found that, I, I can honestly say. Uh, but I think we, we forget a lot of the sounds that appear. For example, aircraft going overhead and these kind of things, which we kind of just filter out uh, one way or another. Now, cities are, of course, places where infrastructure is thickest and experience most pressing. Um, but it's also worth saying, I think, that they've been joined as types of infrastructure, these kinds of physical infrastructure, by a new wave of infrastructure uh, over the last 50 years or so. And that's the ability, I think, to actually make culture into a set of pipes. Uh, in ways which would have been, I think, very difficult in the past because you could not instantaneously transmit uh, a lot of those cultural effects. Uh, it's now possible to actually, I think, do that. Um, and, of course, we can see all kinds of origins uh, for this, the rise of print culture, uh, the rise of bureaucracies, uh, and all kinds of means by which this can be done. Uh, whether it's things like maps uh, or what have you. But the fact of the matter is uh, that it's only really recently that it's really become possible to do this in a very fast fashion, which is akin to what you find in water pipes or something of that sort. Um, and of course I, I bow to uh, Bill on this, but certainly uh, money was I think one of the, the first ways in which people experimented with how it was possible to pass on uh, these kinds of cultural artefacts quickly. And one only has to look uh, at the extraordinary premium very early on in the history of money that was put on speed. Uh, now, of course, we don't even think about the way in which these cultural goods uh, actually turn up rapidly. But it actually is something that is really relatively unique to this historical period. And I think that's partly because large-scale changes uh, in information and communications technology have allowed infrastructure to be extended into many other aspects of life. Uh, all manner of new, if you like, semiotic motors have come into existence, uh, which bypass representation, uh, but can be counted as real presences in the world with important and sometimes devastating effects. You can take money, I think, with all its algorithms and protocols and equations and second and third order derivatives. It sprouted all manner of second order instruments which only exist because of the abilities of this infrastructure. Stop market indices, options and derivatives and the like, based on an infrastructure which depends not only on physical infrastructure like millions of miles of cable or server farms, but also on software, algorithms, data sets and statistics, equations and accountancy conventions. So all that's fine, I'm sure. Uh, and as I come back to the point, many of these payment systems now exactly called rails. But you can see the same thing happening in many other areas of human cultural endeavour. Really quite similar in many ways. In science, for example, in consumption, in mass media, in government even, one only has to look at the rise uh, of so-called security. Uh, the idea that uh, I think states could offer, if you like, some kind of instantaneous guarantee of security uh, is really a remarkably uh, recent one in its, its current form. Uh, and these machines don't act on consciousness as such, but rather impact directly uh, on the affective level, uh, as, as what Guattari calls the continuous variation and force of existing and potential action. Well, that may sound pretty fancy, but what that really means is all those elements that can pulse directly through the body. Rhythm, temporal cues, spatial formats, variation in intensity of luminosity and colour, etc., 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 uh, and all of those things can now turn up in systematized ways uh, pretty well instantaneously. In other words, if you like, another kind of infrastructure has come into existence, which, if you like, overlays the older forms, which, of course, themselves are still developing. Um, and I suppose you could say this in many ways, and it often is talked about in terms of algorithms, etc., etc., but it's basically little machines that pass things on, making decisions uh, as they go on. Um, many of these things, when one starts to think about this, I was reading um, 
you, you struggle for models that work to actually talk about these things. Uh, and I was reading a, a piece in the New Yorker yesterday uh, by a woman copy editor uh, about punctuation. Uh, and one of the ways that might be useful to think about this is the growth, if you like, uh, of a language of punctuation, uh, which goes alongside representational forms of culture, but which becomes more and more important. After all, punctuation was invented. Uh, the comma was invented in Venice around 1500. Uh, there's no reason why you can't think about all the versions of commas and full stops and exclamation marks and these kind of things that are soaking in uh, to in this cult cultural infrastructure at this point in time. Uh, such a signifying signs are machinisms which function whether they necessarily mean something, mean something for a constituency or not. They'll still push things along. Uh, their main goal, in other words, is to reproduce a set number of operations. Um, I particularly like the work of uh, Lacerato and people like that um, in this kind of area. I don't particularly agree with the political conclusions he makes, but uh, I think he's extremely interesting uh, in terms of talking precisely about the kinds of realities that come from uh, software, data and diagnostics, diagrams, algorithms, etc. The kind of things that many people have become interested in, in anthropology, in geography, in sociology, etc., etc., um, I'm particularly impressed, I have to say, by some of the work that uh, Louisa Moore has been doing uh, on security states and the way in which they depend precisely uh, on these kinds of forms of punctuated identification. Now, what in heaven's name, you might be asking at this point, has this got to do with the city? Um, I'm hoping that some of it at least is clear. But what I want to talk about now is um, the way in which cities themselves, as a result of the growth of layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of infrastructure, start themselves to have a presence uh, which is quite clearly in certain, sense, in certain senses uh, independent of simply, if you like, human uh, willpower. And how we can actually talk about that. Uh, novelists have tried to do it for a long time. Uh, Many, many people have tried to do it. Uh, and I would be the first to say that uh, at the moment this is still something that we are working on. But the analogy I suppose we're trying to make, there's a, a, a very uh, well-known book in anthropology called How Forests Think, Eduardo Cohn's book. Uh, we're not trying to do the same thing as that, but it's the same impulse, how cities think. How can one actually work that through. Now, what that means, I think, is we're trying to talk about cities as human presences, but also uh, as more than that. Not least because not all of their activity can be made present to thought, and because they consist of many intersecting modes of existence. We've created in cities something which has, if you like, its own kind of causality, but one which does not, doesn't just coincide or correlate with us. Now, in making this point, of course, you immediately run squarely across, you know, correlationism, uh, etc., etc. Um, but it is the case uh, that what one's trying to do is move outside the kind of thinking that thinks that meaning is only possible between a human mind and what it thinks its objects, flimsy and tenuous as they are. If you like, it's trying to move behind the idea there's no thinking of reality without thinking of it. Um, but that conceit, of course, omits, as much, omits much of what exists. Uh, uh, the problem being, of course, that no one quite knows how to actually figure that at all. Uh, uh, and, of course, there's now a vast subset of philosophy which is trying hard to do that. Um, and it's produced some interesting and some not so interesting work, I suppose. Uh, whatever it is that we're talking about here, um, and there are many arguments about this, it's not simply human domain, but nor is it simply other, and they therefore able to be swept under the carpet. It's a series of relational entities, I think, of one kind or another. To be put it another way, things can belong to the social without being socially constructed. 
Uh, equally, of course, there can be uh, non-human social assemblages like coral reefs and things like that. There's no rigid argument about this. Matter can shift about, can become something else. Um, so cities are social assemblages, but equally they exist as a non-human domain. So how might we think about this? There are various ways. Um, one of the ways, I suppose, though I have my doubts about it, is through Tim Morton's idea of hyperobjects. Uh, Morton actually talks a lot about cities. Uh, and it's quite clear that to some degree he decides they are actually hyperobjects, and I'll, I'll come on to that. Uh, a status they gain by dint of the properties they display, many of which are both in and outside human awareness, exerting a gravitational pull that we can't help but feel can't necessarily be put into words. Well, we'll see about that. According to Morton, three properties are particularly germane in sketching a so-called urban hyperobject. I'd say there are actually four. First, cities are viscous, that it is impossible to get away from the field of concurrences that they generate. Cities stick to us, if you like. Like it or not, we are a part of them. Then, they're non-local, in the sense that everything existing in them has ties to other locations. They are the embodiment, if you like, of action at a distance and at the same time hyperconnected, so they can't easily be separated into distinct but interacting parts or into the general and the particular. Everything overflows, everything is wrapped in something else. Uh, everything that exists, if you like, always coexists in cities. They're temporary discontinuous with human lives. They consist not only of human-scaled thoughts and practices, but all other kinds of other modes of what one might call sentience, each with their own timelines and modes of intervention in the world. None of them is necessarily consistent with the others, but each of them is able to interfere with each other, uh, and that, I think, is important too. Yet at the same time, everyone is affected in some way by the city. Cities are also forms of regularity which impose a kind of order on this surging crowd of becomings. Uh, in the work that we did on clock time, uh, one of the things that became very clear was that in pre-modern cities, one of the major ways uh, in which you could find the time was by listening to the city. Uh, and simply the din of traffic was a good indicator by itself of what time it actually was. So those kind of things. Finally, of course, cities are configurational, and that configuration, I think, makes a serious difference. Um, there's a particularly interesting area of, I suppose you'd say, architecture called space syntax, which has been going now for 40, 50 years, I would think. But it's come up with more and more interesting findings about how the configurations of cities actually affect human behaviour. Uh, and something, I think, to look at. So, at least those four ways. Now, if you look in the literature, of course, uh, people have used all kinds of ways of trying to talk about these kinds of non-human effects. Um, I I, in, the, in the paper, we just go through a list of them. Ontographs, Ian Bogos' work. Uh, multiverses, maybe. Um, grids of various forms. What it, whichever thing, way you describe it, there's no simple presence or absence or foreground and background or natural or natural or withdrawn and sensual to be found. These concepts, they don't evaporate exactly, but they only tell part of the story. Uh, there's a sense of nearness, if you like, there's a sense of intimacy, even if not a sense of belonging, which is brought about by alignments that may be regular and predictable, but equally can actually be the precise reverse. Uh, Morton, I think, actually puts it well in this, in this basis. Think of a city. A city contains all kinds of paths and streets that one might have no idea of on a day-to-day -day basis. Yet even more so, you could live in a city such as London for 50 years and never fully grasp it in its scintillating, oppressive, joyful Londonness. The streets and parks of London, the people who live there, the trucks that drive through its streets, constitute London, but are not reducible to it. London is not a whole greater than the sum of its parts, nor is London reducible to these parts. Uh, London can't be undermined downward or upward. Likewise, London isn't just an effect of my mind, a human construct. 
Nor is London something that only exists when I walk through the Victoria Line Tunnel to the Tate Gallery at Pimlico Underground Station, or when I think about London. London can't be overmined into an after-effect of some human process such as thinking or driving or essay writing. Now, Morton's not saying you can't do those things, but he's saying it can't just be that. So, okay, how can we actually end to start to approach these kind of things? And this is where we get to the, the kind of $64,000 question, I suppose, uh, which I can answer about $3 of. <laughs> What might be our method when we want to understand the city as more than humans, not just about subjective access? Um, I think that part of it must mean that we've got to learn to listen, and that that listening will involve making things a lot of the time. And this, of course, is a great thing to be in, in anthropology, is one of the things that anthropologists have become very interested in anyway. Um, so far, in a sense, I think we've only partly listened uh, to what cities are actually telling us, and that's partly because I think we intervene only in very specific ways in them. Um, but at their best, I think, cities point us towards a way of being human that's not coextensive with the person or the thing, or with the perpetual transfer between the one and the other that we appear to be fated to until now. I think back to Eduardo Cohn's work and the way in which he talks about different kinds of transfers that might actually be possible, and that clearly, amongst some peoples in the world, are actually being worked with all the time. Instead, of, cities can offer ways of living which, in opposition to purity, can provide infrastructures which are open to multiplicity, plurality and plurivocity, alteration and metamorphosis, uh, and so on and so forth. And in a sense, I think the big engineering project uh, of the 21st century is to build cities like that. If we can build cities like that, we might, if you like, have a chance. Uh, so it's an important thing, I think, to think through. Um, but there's no reason why cities' infrastructures have to be the way they are. Uh, we'd have to change all sorts of things in order to make them different. But it's not impossible to do that. It really is not. And I can give you many examples of that. Um, there's particularly interesting work, I think, looking at the frozen politics of city infrastructures. Uh, some of you uh, who are architects may know Kim Easterling's work on uh, what she calls extra statecraft. Uh, that is the way in which actually a lot of the decisions in the world have been taken away from politics and put in infrastructure. And what she's talking about is trying to get that politics back again. Whether that's possible, uh, I don't know, but she's having a good go at it. Her book, if you don't know it, is really, I think, very interesting. Going on from that, you need to think about the dreams and desires that were in infrastructure when it was first built and what happened to them as, uh, if you like, the whole thing was laid down. There's wonderful work in uh, history and historical geography and so on, precisely about these kind of things. I think, for example, of a colleague of mine who did some wonderful work uh, on the English freeway system when it came first into existence. And when it first came into existence, it came into existence with all the dreams and desires of modernity, uh, of a kind of technological solution to absolutely everything. Um, if you look at um, the, the so-called M1 now, I don't think anyone would really think that, but there we are. So one thing I think we need to do is think much more about these things. And there's a lot of people, I think, now starting to think about how we can design things uh, way, way better in terms of infrastructure. And by that I mean design them genuinely, politically, from the start. This is not something which is a feature of later on when you've laid it down. Second thing, I think, is, and this is something I'm interested in because um, I think it's something that universities on the whole are not massively good at, um, we need to think about ways in which we can change engineering. Uh, I've become increasingly clear that there are all kinds of possibilities uh, to do that, actually. Um, there's actually, in a way, 
probably shouldn't say this uh, on tape, but there we are. Um, there's a, there's a kind of, there are a set of issues at the moment around engineering and its conduct. Uh, not in all countries in the world, but certainly uh, in many. Um, and a lot of those are based on the fact that it simply provides solutions to problems which are already set, when it actually needs to set the problems up to begin with before it starts trying to solve them. Uh, and people have started to work this through in quite strong ways. There are a whole set of educational experiments going on, especially actually in the United States, but in some other countries as well, trying to refigure the engineering curriculum to make it into something which will work better for making cities. And there is absolutely no reason why that goal is not possible, uh, except, of course, um, uh, centuries of inertia, uh, um, certain degree of conservatism, uh, etc. Um, and in doing that, of course, you, you have all kinds of very useful byproducts, I might add, which I can talk about a little later. Um, I'm not trying to think then that engineers become kind of the new philosopher kings, if I can put it that way. It's not that kind of thing. It's more that um, they start engineering way back uh, from where engineering is at the moment. Uh, you actually try for yourself to formulate what the problem is that you're trying to solve. You try and work through what the options are with other people in a kind of democratic fashion. Then you go and try and make something on the basis of that. Um, that has been done in the history of design, in the history of architecture, but boy, it is difficult to do. I was in an architecture school at least twice, uh, and it was hard pounding, uh, as the saying goes. Um, but at the same time, it is feasible. I know it's feasible, because I know of at least two colleges in the United States that are actually trying to do uh, precisely this. And then the last thing that I think is worth looking at, and I say this with I know people from uh, English and others in the room with a certain degree of hesitation, is I think it is worth thinking again about how we actually write about cities. And I think one of the things that's interesting is that there are attempts, I think, to actually do this now, which really are fascinating, flawed, uh, but if we can't get there, it's going to be very difficult. Um, all kinds of ways that people are thinking about this. Now, uh, these are, again, speculative ways of writing about cities. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Often they do sort of vaguely cross-cut with science fiction. They vaguely cross-cut with nature writing and so on and so forth. Um, so, for example, uh, you can see this in the, set work, in the works of a set of, I think, of particular kinds of authors who are trying to think about cities as, if you like, kind of alien beings, um, but not in ways which are trying to make, they're trying to make them alien in order to come back and understand them better. Um, I had a colleague at Warwick for a long time, a science fiction writer called China Mayville, uh, who I think actually did this twice really rather successfully. A book called Embassy Town in particular, I think, is absolutely brilliant at, uh, at working these things through. But there are other people working on this. There's another science fiction writer, uh, M. John Harrison, who actually lives literally about 10 miles away from Warwick, uh, who's been working for a long time on how you can reconfigure space. Uh, and again, he doesn't get all the way there, but these are really interesting things. And then I think the last thing is to try and think about what nature writing would look like, uh, the classic um, spread of nature writing, uh, if you really wanted to apply it to these kinds of urban environments. Uh, what would, if you like, a deep ecology look like uh, under those kinds of circumstances? What would Thoreau or Dillard or someone like that have done uh, if they'd actually been writing about cities? Now, I have no idea what they would do before we go any farther. Uh, just a couple of instances, though, only to um, uh, end on, mainly because I just happened to come across them fairly recently. Uh, one of those is um, uh, a movement that's actually out of Oxford, uh, the so-called Dark Mountain Project. 
um, which um, in all sorts of ways is a highly problematic movement. Uh, let me be very clear about that. But at the same time, I think in terms of how it is trying to write, I think is very interesting. Um, they're, perhaps, they're wondering if perhaps they do not understand things as well as they imagined. The machine is stuttering. The engineers are in panic. Um, well, that's what they think, but I've talked to engineers and I don't think that's true. Uh, they're wondering whether they're controlling it at all or whether perhaps it is controlling them. Better by far to look down to uncivilization than to look up to civilization. Better by far to look over the edge and cultivate an uncivilized writing. The point is actually one of the interesting things about this is the kind of writings they're talking about may transfer better to the urban realm than they do to the natural realm. And I think that's even more true of the other person I thought I'd mentioned just in conclusion, which is Jeff Van Der Meer, uh, his uh, Area X trilogy, uh, which is often understood as the depiction of a kind of natural extremity, a kind of full speed ahead reversal of the Anthropocene. Uh, you know, the opaque Area X might just as well be thought of as a reading, however, of urbanity, in which everything turns into something else. Yes, of course, in his books, in his trilogy, Area X is a means of clearing the world of anthropogenic poisoning and then starting in on the human too. But it can be equally read as a reading of contemporary cities in which the human, if you like, is in transition. Uh, and in which it's possible to think, just as people think about forests in different ways, about cities and about the people, more, more specifically about all the different beings within them in different ways. So I'll stop there, uh, and I apologise for the highly speculative nature of this paper, but there we are. Thank you. Um, happy to field your own Yes, absolutely. Yeah, about. sure. Yeah, Great. yeah. We've got some time for, for Q&A. Maybe someone right off the bat in the back. Thank you for that wonderful lecture. I've long had a tremendous disciplinary envy of the Americans for their ability to do that. And I'm very impressed with the So I, I think what it portends for the issue of scale. Um, so um, you can go several ways on this. Uh, one of them is that you could produce, if you like, a kind of new localism in various ways, because the kinds of infrastructures that are coming into existence at this point uh, can be designed so they are whether both general and extremely local, both at the same time. That's one way you could do it. Another way, if you really wanted to, you could go the other way and talk about some kind of thing like a kind of period of global urbanity, in which everything links with everything else, uh, kind of thing that I suppose is a kind of extrapolation of maybe what the Fevre and other people might be talking about. Um, I actually think, though, there are, I actually think that that is not what's going to happen. I th one of the points I'm trying to make, but probably not making very well, is I actually think cities, through their different infrastructural mixes, etc., etc., have actually very different presences. Uh, and actually, if you go to them, most of the time, you can work that out. Uh, and um, I think that, in a sense, means that the kind of scale we need to talk about is one in which cities can still figure, if you like, as individual or at least individuated entities. Um, going on from that, of course, the one thing that I think is possible to do now that was perhaps more difficult to do before is you can design scale. Uh, you, could, you, 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 know, you can work it out for yourself in all sorts of ways. Uh, uh, information technology may mean that in time people will be able to actually scale their world in ways they cannot actually do uh, at the moment. And I think that will be interesting too. Uh, you know, each person or social group will be able to have, if you like, something akin to their own kind of country. Uh, if you look at what's happening at the moment, um, uh, if you look at some of the, the work that's going on in information technology, that's almost kind of happening anyway. I mean, uh, one of the things that's striking is the degree to which there is, within these cities, very heavy forms of localization. I'm not sure that entirely uh, answers the point, but anyway. Very briefly, um, 
about the role of industrial agriculture and food security in relation to cities. And yeah, yeah. Sort of, in, in some ways, the infrastructure of the city absolutely depends upon infrastructure outside of the city. So I, want, I was wondering if you could say anything about the food. Yes, I can, but not much. Um, so, um, of course, uh, one only has to look back to um, uh, something like 17th century London or something like that, and, and the way in which people had already noticed, uh, you know, the, the continuous flows of food coming into cities, uh, um, even by that time, or indeed ancient Rome. You can go to a whole series of these places and see that cities only exist because of these enormous agricultural hinterlands. Um, what, in a sense, I think is somewhat different is that, of course, nowadays, these hinterlands really do spread out in massive ways uh, and intersect with each other. Um, and that uh, is part of the problem that we probably now face uh, in the sense that one of the things I think that uh, is a kind of symptom of our our age is everyone thinks you can move everything around. Just because you can move everything around doesn't mean it's a good thing to move everything around. Uh, and when it comes to agriculture, I'm absolutely sure that that's, that's true. Um, so, when I'm talking about cities, it's true I am talking about, if you like, the built form configuration and those kind of things. Uh, but I would argue that, if you like, the footprint of cities now is enormous and many of them intersect those footprints with each other. That doesn't mean, however, that they're not different. Uh, going on from that, of course, the other thing is we've got to get rid of cows as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious how you would um, interact with the work of Valverde, Marianne Valverde, who's done such interesting work on seeing like a city, and just two things that she's done that strike me as sort of looking up to the stuff you're talking about here is one, the way in which she emphasizes how cities are created with these kinds of police departments and fire fire departments and school districts and city council districts that often are incompatible, use different databases, don't line up, or not isomorphic, and no one seems to care. And there's not a kind of teleology necessarily towards having a uniformity. And it's sort of on that line as well, she does this fascinating stuff on the category of the legal non-conforming, that cities are full of buildings that aren't supposed to be five stories tall, we got an exception to them, or that aren't supposed to have a restaurant underneath, but that got done. And she sort of talks about how there's a kind of illegality at the very heart of modernist urban law and infrastructure. And so she's thinking here about infrastructure and policy. But I just, do you have any sort of comments on how the framework that you're building here sort of intersects with with her work, because that seems like a, another great example of very careful work on this stuff. No, absolutely. Um, I mean, it, it's a bit like, you know, seeing like a state, seeing like a city, these kinds of things. Um, in particular, much of the technology uh, that, if you like, uh, sits alongside the, the kind of built infrastructure is the kinds of uh, technology that she's talking about. Uh, it's technology of standardization, of categorization, of distribution, etc., etc. Uh, and um, I'm particularly keen, I have to say, um, and the work going on from that of Patrick Joyce, uh, who's a, a 19th century historian, who's done some wonderful work on um, 19th century liberalism as it actually attaches to cities and the way in which a lot of this technology uh, was invented in one form or another uh, at that particular point. I think what's different now, though, is that technology always existed, but now a lot of it's been able to be set in motion in ways which were much more difficult in the past. So, I mean, of course, if, if you look at cities in the past, one of the problems they faced was they didn't know who was there in quite strong ways. Uh, and um, uh, they had ways of doing it, but they were, to put it mildly, a lot of the time somewhat random. Uh, but a lot of places had address systems, but a lot of places didn't, etc., uh, etc. Et a lot of places tried uh, to produce ways of identifying their citizens, but a lot of places didn't. I mean, you know, uh, uh, things like tattoos and these kind of things were more prevalent than people think. Uh, so there are ways in which one can see these kind of things 
as having many historical precedents, but I think what's different now is the ability to set them in motion, if you like, as real pipes. You know, they become absolutely part of the infrastructure that can reach down uh, into everyday life in a way which would have been much more difficult in the past. If you think about, um, uh, think about the Chinese state, for example, uh, and uh, the block system uh, and these kinds of things... Um, Actually, in many ways, those things will be superseded. Uh, in a sense, we have our own block systems now. Uh, and um, one of the things that's also fascinating about China is the way that it's precisely trying to take control of this transport culture. Uh, and it's not clear to me that it can't be done, by the way. Uh, so again, I think that's interesting as well. Um, so I'm certainly not trying to ignore these kind of things. If it sounded like I was, I apologise. <laughs> Oh, go ahead. Um, okay, so I, I was wondering, um, in your talk, this is really interesting, um, what, what happens when cities go away? And I don't mean um, in terms of ghost towns or, you know, when the aliens come back and they search our geological record, but in terms of um, when mining towns and factory camps and, you know, remote scientific research stations are environmentally or ecologically restored or remediated, when people make an active effort to erase the city, um, what happens to uh, depends on where you're talking about. If it's a ghost town, then there wasn't much infrastructure to begin with, uh, I suspect. Uh, if it's a mining town or something like that, if it's the middle of Detroit, uh, then that's a different matter altogether, I think. Um, one of the things, though, that I think also becomes clear... Uh, that, that I think a lot of people in architecture have become very interested in is the whole uh, issue of decay of infrastructure uh, and how you work with that. Um, so, for example, buildings uh, are continually rotting away. Uh, they need almost continuous maintenance to keep going. Uh, and um, architects often have not taken that process into account in the way that they've designed buildings. There's been some really famous work on on this, indeed. Uh, and um, those kind of things, I think, uh, are things that people have become more actively interested in because as they, in a sense, see infrastructure as more and more prevalent, so it becomes more and more important to take into account uh, these kinds of forms of decay. Now, I'm taking those as different from forms of decay which are simply breakdowns or collapses or this kind of thing. Uh, most of which can be mended, uh, truth to tell. Uh, but part of the configuration of cities, of course, is, again, that some cities are way more resilient uh, than others. Uh, classic example, I think, City of Auckland in New Zealand, um, which was, part of it was completely blocked off, uh, I think, three or four days in terms of power because uh, a rat uh, ate through the main power cable from one side of the city to the other. Uh, so, um, you know, there are interesting things again around that, and uh, that, it, again, depends on configuration. Was the Anthropocene striking back or not? Right, sorry. Uh, I have a question about method or, uh, or approach to thinking about um, the infrastructural or the Anthropocene, um, especially in cities, and this kind of tension... Um, or it, it, it's not a tension, but in, uh, kind of oscillation, even in your own talk, the, the wonderful talk that you just gave, between a, sort of attending to the presentness of the present, right, or sort of the possibilities of the present, or, or what the present um, offers in and of itself, and a kind of return, at least for some of us, to um, a longer time horizon, a deep time horizon, right? Um, and there seems to be a kind of impetus, right, to sort of um, think along, not just a sort of long durée horizon, right, but a kind of geological um, time horizon. And I'm, and I'm just curious if you have um, any thoughts about that, that, that sort of dueling methodological tension uh, approaching the Anthropocene, say. It's quite clear that one of the, the political tasks is try to attend to the long term. Uh, and... Um, uh, many modern societies are not wonderfully good at that. Uh, it, and uh, so, uh, when, if, if specifically when it comes to certain forms of infrastructure, you don't think, so what will this mean for people in a hundred years' time? 
if I do this. And part of the reworking, I think, of the curriculum is going to have to be down to thinking in those kinds of terms. Um, going on from that, though, the, one of the things I think which is an impetus for what's going on now, uh, in terms of some of the, the thoughts I was trying to have, is that actually, of course, cities have been around a very long time. Uh, and in a sense, uh, part of it is you can actually start to see them not as geologic formations, that's not, that's not quite right, but you can start to see them as very long-term entities. There are, there are some parts of the world which have been in urban occupation for, you know, over a thousand years, way over. So, I mean, um, it's, it's certainly worth thinking about these kind of things and about how you would really work this through. Now, if you think about that in terms of... Uh, uh, literature again, there are people who have tried to write those kinds of accounts of cities and they haven't tried to do it as kind of, you know, here's a history of everything that went on, but they've tried to do it in way more impressionistic terms. I think about that as being interesting. <coughs> there are various forms of art which have tried to do this actually. Um, so, you know, there are things to think about. How do you operate uh, when you start thinking long term? Uh, and um, we've got to design these kind of things in. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, one of the things that some of these US colleges are trying to do is to try and um, produce that kind of sense of responsibility uh, for engineers. Uh, um, they, are, after all, are very proud that the things they do last a long time. That's one of the things that's good about it. Uh, but then it's about trying to actually make them work with, so, but what does that mean that it does that? And how, for example, if you do that, do you block off other kinds of things that might appear, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Thank you. 
rebuild that, but where are you going to rebuild it when everything else is going to be in flux? So you've got these major challenges of how you protect, rebuild, you know, all of these coastal cities or coastal settlements, which is where most humans live. So that's another, that's just an enormous planning challenge. I'm not sure anyone knows. I, I can see people having answers to the first problem. You know, rebuild, retrofitting the existing buildings, pipelines, and so forth. I don't see much hope for anyone solving the other problem in the long run for most human habitation. And, that, and it really seems right now that's what could do us all in. Uh, right. Well, I don't have the the uh, uh, the keys to saving the planet before we go any further. Um, I, uh, as I mean, and I argued back and forth about this because one of the conclusions I think we've we've come to is that the political t one of the political tasks which is really pressing is actually producing what one might call mass engineering. Uh, that actually what needs to happen uh, in, in not a short period of time is that some of these infrastructural networks need to be radically changed. Uh, the problem is um, that sounds, <laughs> and to some degree is, uh, uh, a kind of centralised project. Uh, you cannot get away from that. Um, the, wor the whole world is not Denmark, if I can put it that way. Uh, and um, that causes immense difficulties and angst for us, I think it's fair to say. Uh, but in the end, I think we think that without that mass engineering of cities, you would never be able to do a lot of these things fast enough to catch up with what the problem is. So the political question is, how in heaven's name you actually do that, and I do not know the answer. I'd be the first to say. It is a real issue, though, I think. Uh, and it's an issue that's very specific a lot of the time to certain kinds of democracies, which are not built uh, to do this kind of thing. Um, thank you. Good talk. Um, I'm curious uh, to hear you talk a little bit more about politics um, and the role of politics. Like it's been mentioned here and there. And it seems to me that politics is intimately tied to infrastructure. The, in the uh, um, extension of infrastructure, the maintenance of infrastructure, or the absence of it. Um, and I'm wondering, well, one, just talk a little bit more about it, but is it another kind of infrastructure that we should consider? It also seems like an incredibly undependable <laughs> infrastructure. Um, Sorry, what I, uh, you mean po politics as an infrastructure itself? Yeah, I mean, I don't know, P perhaps, but it seems to be like a big part of Um, so, certain parts of politics actually are becoming infrastructural. <laughs> uh, um, as they coincide with uh, information and communications technology, uh, parts of it are becoming, to some degree, automatic. Uh, now, we can argue backwards and forwards about whether that's a good thing, uh, because actually it's been used by, uh, I suspect, political groups you might not like and political groups you do like. So I think it's, uh, it's one of those things one has to work with. Uh, but I think the fact of the matter is that more and more of this will become like that. Uh, and that means you have to then step back and think where the politics actually is in systems of that kind. Uh, and part of it will actually be in things like the software systems, the categorizations, etc., etc., that are used by these various political forces. That's one thing. However, going on from that, do I like this? Not in the slightest. Uh, I'm a complete political traditionalist. Uh, and um, particularly for me, um, the reason for that is once you start pipelining politics, you make it more and more predictable. Whereas the most important thing about politics in many ways is that new things come out of it, that it's formative. Uh, it's not a case of just, this is what I think and this is what I'm going to do. It's actually a process in its own right. Um, what worries me is once you pipeline that, you do get yourself into problems. Uh, so there is a real challenge, I think, about how one works with that. Um, there we are. Okay. On the unpredictability of politics, <laughs> it's um, infrastructural failures, which also are 
modes of potentiality. Nigel, thank you so much for okay. the talk. All right. Thank Cheers. you. Chance to get some food, please do. Um, and again, thank you all for coming.